Welcome to Pressure Point, I'm Brad Newcomb. There's a growing interest in spirituality in our society, but is this a movement toward or away from organized religions? Some people want nothing to do with the traditional expressions of faith, while others embrace them. My two guests tonight have chosen the more traditional route. They're members of the Christian Church, and they're here to say what that means to them on their journeys of faith and spirituality. And with me is Susan Fitch, who is a youth worker with the United Church of Canada, and also Michelle Slater, who is studying for ministry in the United Church of Canada. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Okay. Susan and Michelle, one of the expressions that I hear over and over again is, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual person. How would you describe yourselves, Michelle? That's a hard one. I think that uh, especially among people my age, to be seen as a religious person is to be seen negatively, and that's why people kind of disclaim, oh no, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual person. And we hear a lot the phrase, you know, you don't have to go to church to be spiritual, which um, I would really agree with. I just find it a lot easier to be in touch with my spirituality when I'm with a community of other people that are trying to do the same thing. I think it's pretty hard to stay connected to yourself, and to God, however you perceive God, on your own. So Susan, how would you describe yourself? Well, I think probably more spiritual than religious is the, the term that I would use uh, for some of the reasons that Michelle has described because of the uh, social connotations of the word religious and, um, and how other people would perceive that term. Um, I think I see spirituality connected uh, a lot more with a personal feeling mm -hmm. and, um, and my faith for me is a very personal issue. So that is probably the word I would choose. Um, but I also like to be with others uh, who share a similar faith uh, in a supportive community of that nature. Is that the difference between spiritual and religious to you? I mean, does spiritual mean personal? Religious means you suddenly are part of a wider community? I think so. I mean, just just the, the way you talk about you know, it's organized religion. It's organized um, groups of people organized together through f to express their faith, um, whether through worship services or fellowship of other kinds, um, eating together, raising children together, as well as kind of worship services. And I think that when people talk about being spiritual, they really mean something that they do on their own, something that's really personal. And I think that people prefer to talk about that because they don't want to be judged and they don't want their relationship with themselves and with creation and with God to be somehow judged by other people. But that hasn't been my experience in religion. Okay. Uh, when I introduced you, I said that you've chosen, that there is this interest in spirituality in our society, and you've chosen the more traditional route because uh, you're members of the Christian church. Uh, is it difficult being a part of the Christian church today? I think a lot of times it is. Um, I think society in general tends to be going away from um, the traditional Christian church anyways. And um, Look, it is hard because people yeah, are moving away. I think, yeah, I think that, that, um, that society is seeing this, this change in the church. And um, so you're saying, what kind of changes? What, what kind of changes are happening in the church? Hmm. Well, I think a lot of times what's happening now is um, not necessarily changes with the church, but changes that people see or perceive as far as necessity to be a part of the church. Mm -hmm. And um, there have been a lot of 
problems um, or there are there are some difficulties um, as far as as far as bad publicity for the church and problems in the news and that sort of thing which I think are starting to turn people off of organized religion and from going to church and and people are starting to think well if I can have this without being part of the institution why be part of the institution and I think time is also another consideration that uh, more and more people are getting caught up with other activities or interested in being part of other activities um, that conflict with the traditional Sunday morning time for church and so that's not a possibility for them anymore. Right, so maybe, and of course we can get into that a little later but maybe then the church could change and not always have everything on Sunday morning. Well then you, you, we've said that there are people that are moving away, there's still this interest in spirituality and here the two of you are, you are a youth worker in mm -hmm. the church, uh, Susan, and you're studying to be a ministry. So what is keeping you there? I mean, you, you obviously have some of the secrets here. What's keeping well, you? Well, I wouldn't ask me that when I'm having a bad day. Uh, sometimes, actually really often, I say that to myself. I, when I butt up kind of once too often against the structure that's really rigid and that won't move, and that I experience as really oppressive, um, I, I, I ask myself, what am I doing in this institution when I could be so much freer outside of it? But I think that the church at its best offers a vision of community that is more whole and more life-giving than anything I can find in the outside culture. Okay, now, but you mentioned vision. We have to, we, we, we need more than visions to keep us attached to something. There has oh, to be something real. Oh, I agree, real. and I think that that's So what, the, what's the part that, re, like, what's the day-to-day -day stuff then that makes it real? Well, I think that that's a really good point and I think that the reason that a lot of people have been moving away from organized religion is that what's actually happening concretely has not matched up to the vision and so people see a lot of hypocrisy in that I mean I don't think it's just bad publicity when we talk about abuses that the mm -hmm. church have have done in the name of religion like residential schools um, almost every week we turn on the news and we hear of another clergy person who's being charged with sexual abuse or sexual harassment or some kind of abuse of their power so I don't think it's it's not really unreasonable for people to become suspicious or wary of the church. And again, when I say the church at its best, the church at its best actually lives out and has integrity to the vision that it kind of espouses to the rest of society. And the reason why I'm in the church is that that's the only place that I really see that, that whole vision of how we all need to live and work together and I'm hoping that by staying within the church I can help to um, keep on promoting it and keep on pushing the church to change to be more in integrity with the vision that it offers. Okay, uh, Reginald Bibby who is a sociologist uh, in Canada, he did a, a study on teen trends and came up with some statistics that are like 97% of teenagers believe in God uh, Eleven percent can be found in Canadian congregations and churches. Okay, uh, there's a big gap there because everybody. The one thing that everybody knows about churches is that they have something to do with God or are supposed to. You know, if you want to learn about God or experience God or and all those kinds of things. Okay, you are the generation, that same generation. Maybe you can provide some insight into how to bridge that gap, how to maybe narrow the gap a little bit. Any ideas? Well, I think that a lot of times I, I work a lot with youth and try and do a lot of ministry with youth to offer them what the church has to offer in terms of that community and in terms of that support and that connection to whatever is bigger than all of us. And I think that the reason that a lot of youth and adults aren't in the church is because of what I was talking about before, that kind of lack of integrity between what happens concretely and what the church says it's all about. And I think that because people of my generation have so many less ties and loyalties mm -hmm. to institutions than people of, of older generations, that we just don't have those the same kind of loyalties and we'll look elsewhere to try and find it. So but you must have experienced something that's quite meaningful. I mean, Susan, can you give me some stories, some experiences that you've had where it's been quite meaningful for you? Because you're here. I mean, you're, you're, you're here representing uh, youth work and uh, involved with people. Well, a lot of my experience that's really um, been meaningful for me has actually been outside of the 
sanctuary type of experience has been camping and um, youth group and that sort of thing. Um, in, my, in the particular congregations that I've been part of, there was always a real attempt to include myself and the other youth and to really have our voices heard. And so we got to be involved in things such as church services and in the selection of the hymns and in that kind of thing, which really helped me feel empowered. And like I had something hands-on in the church, I was involved in the church. And that is a lot of what has kept me there and a lot of what's been a um, really powerful experience for me um, is knowing that I've been a part of this process. Mm -hmm. um, now that hasn't always been true, but with the particular congregation that I was with, um, was something that was that was really noticeable, and that the the minister and the congregation and everyone really worked together to achieve. Um, yeah, and I had, I would say, a really similar experience when I was growing up within the church. I attended youth group and I led youth groups of of people who are younger than me, and I was really encouraged to develop kind of all the different skills or talents that I had, and was really supported in a way that I wasn't outside, which was mostly high school, which was a really non-supportive place, which was a really threatening mm -hmm. place in some ways. And it was also just a really good place to learn about getting along with people mm -hmm. without kind of the other pressures that school gave me, particularly kind of boy-girl or man-woman relationships. Mm -hmm. It was good to be in a place where you could talk to a boy and just talk <laughs> right. without kind of being in that high school setting, which immediately is so kind of, oh, you, it must be your boyfriend or it must be your girlfriend. Like there was a, so it was a little safer kind of dynamic. A safer environment, a little more comfortable, yeah. a little more community oriented and so on. Yeah. Okay. So th well, now uh, those are some of the specifics then that I can understand that uh, drew you in or that you found there and that kept you there. Uh, what about, I mean, other conferences, retreats and stuff like that? I mean the youth conferences, some experiences with those kinds of things, where you bring together people from different areas? Those have also been really important experiences to me, and I guess for about the past five years I've been involved with um, youth programming and that sort of thing outside of my congregation. What makes that appealing? I think a lot of it is a community aspect, uh, getting a chance to meet others, and um, what happens then? What happens? to uh, like, well, Just describe. I don't know what happens at a youth conference, so what happens? Well, my experience of the conferences is uh, usually weekend-long retreats where youth from various areas are brought together or, you know, they're, they're asked to, to come. Um, and it's, you know, it's often theme-related. We worship, we sing, we eat together. We usually, you know, we're in, we're in cabins together. Um, we're in small groups, we're in large groups, and there's a lot of community building done, and there's usually an exploration of, of some issue or some aspect of our faith, um, as, as well as just a lot of fun time um, with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the most important things for me growing up, <clears throat> and for me now when I lead these kinds of events, is the opportunity that youth have to um, question what, what they believe or what they're beginning to believe or even to just throw out the questions that they have that they don't know the answers for. What are some mm -hmm. of the questions? Why are we here? What happens when we die? How, how are men and women supposed to get along anyway? Um, is it okay to have sex? Um, questions around what is God or who is God? or Who is God? Who is Jesus? How can I have a relationship with something that I can't see? Do I want to have a relationship with something mm -hmm. that I can't see? What is it like to be a friend? What happens when someone hurts you? Um, how do you reconcile with people? Those questions, by the way, I don't think they sound any different than people <laughs> that are non-youth uh, would ask. I mean, the, the, the important thing is we often just never get around to asking them, do we? No, and I think a lot of youth have experienced in the, in the church, in the congregations, that it's not okay to ask those questions, yeah. or they're given really pat answers that don't kind of plumb the depths of of this really serious questions. And 
as you say, these are the really serious questions that life is all about. I mean, these are about. the questions at the crux of life that everyone wants to ask, and these are the questions that move us when a movie tells a story well and through a plot and dialogue and so on, and, and we end up talking about it at water coolers in our office or, right. you know, in uh, cafes over coffee. I mean, that's, those are the kind of questions that really engage us. And the church has all this kind of raw material. This is what the church, I guess, is, is, I think, is built on and provides people the chance to come together to do this. But often that isn't the experience. I want to get back to your youth conferences. You've obviously had a good time. How appealing would these be to outsiders, to people who've never grown up in the church? Because I know that in many of my associations, many people have no experience whatsoever in the church. So they're not going to know the hymns. They're not going to know the format. They're not going to know the language. Mm -hmm. So how appealing, and how do you help bridge that gap? Well, I mean... tough questions, by the way. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're <laughs> I think that... Uh, it is hard to get away from the kind of church mindset. I mean, I grew up in the church, and I never realized how kind of subsumed I was by it until I went to work at a camp for the summer with people who were primarily non-churched. And my job was to be the chaplain and to coordinate a theological program, in other words, to help, help people think about the theological questions of camp. You know, what are we, what are we doing here? What's brought us together? And it was really hard for me to figure out a way to do that in language that they could hear, not just the language that I knew from growing up in the church. But I think that that's something that we do work really hard at, because youth don't speak the same kind of theological language that people in the congregations do, I don't think. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what theological language is. Um, um, I think that in the church we have certain kind of code words for talking about what we're doing, and I don't think that youth necessarily have access to what those code words mean. Uh, yeah, I think that there must be special I issues for youth. I would want to say that I don't think that adults have any more <laughs> access to them either. That's probably true. I just true. think that that's language <laughs> that just people can't understand. Yeah. I mean, that's my feeling. Uh, a lot of it can be gobbledygook, mm -hmm. you know, it just goes over. Or what I say, if I say one word, if I say the word sin, or if I say the word evangelism, or if I say whatever word, other people hear different things. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is a challenge. Susan, some of the people you do, you're a youth worker uh, in <laughs> the Lower Mainland here. Who are some of the people that you work with? <coughs> well, I work um, primarily with those who are already in congregations. In, in the area. Um, I work with youth, I work with um, those labeled young adults. Um, What's the difference between a youth and a young adult? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, the church has sort of put an age distinction there as far as, you know, youth are kind of called, you know, 12 to 18 and young adults 18 to 30 with some overlap in there and there's no really clear definition. So um, I can't be a young adult anymore? I don't think so. <laughs> no, <darn it. laughs> You're an old adult now. I'm an old <laughs> adult. Oh, that's crushing. <laughs> okay, I'll um, take my place. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, and I think you know, I think that's a lot of a lot of the issue too is who is who is part of these group and when is the cutoff? Like as soon as you have your thirtieth birthday, you're no longer a young adult. But um, but that approximate age group is the folks that I work with, as mm -hmm. well as the youth leaders. Um, I I work with with the congregations that don't have youth groups um, to see what sort of program they might need or, or what kind of assistance I could give them if they're looking to establish a program. So those are the kind of folks that I work with on a fairly regular basis, um, as well as other folk in the area who are really interested and supportive of this ministry. But I think what you say about the age, kind of hard to distinguish, is really interesting because my congregation offers a once a month worship um, for young adults, and it's planned by young adults, and it's planned kind of for young adults, kind of a different approach to what worship might be. Mm -hmm. And the number of old adults that we get coming to our worship, because it's something that's actually real and that speaks to them, is amazing. And it, it makes me question wh whether we shouldn't be having all of our worship services the way we have ours, just because... Well, maybe, because I like those kind of questions, and I always want to be a young adult. <laughs> That's I don't right. Want to be, Come on I down. Don't want to there be is room for there you. There is room for me to be still young, That's you right. know? That's right. Young at heart. Young at heart. That's right. Always young at heart. Yeah. I was part of a very similar experience in Victoria when I lived on the island, and uh, we had the same thing. We, we started up a service, uh, an alternative 
church service um, for young adults um, primarily, and we were primarily the ones that organized it from within the group, the organization came. Um, but we had quite a number that were interested and quite a number that came that um, would not fall in the 18 to 30 age group. But they liked the idea of an alternative service. They, they I like that. liked the idea mm. of, of coming and getting some needs met that they didn't feel were necessarily met in their congregations or uh, in the Sunday morning kind of traditional approach. So what are some of the, the, the concerns, the issues, the differences that you see in these kind of uh, settings? When you, when you bring together people and it's alternative, you call it alternative services and there's a little more freedom. There, I hope, it mm -hmm. sounds like there's more freedom a little less rigid, a little less traditional. Yeah. Um, but you're usually, focusing on God and, and the mm -hmm. Christian story, and, but you do things differently, that's it? Well, there's w much more of an emphasis, I think, on actually engaging um, mm -hmm. the issue or the topic or each other. Um, a lot of times the traditional church service is you come in, you sit down, you face the front, someone talks at you, you look in a hymn book and sing, and then you walk out. And unless you go for coffee, you really haven't engaged with anyone And you at can't all. stand up and say in the middle when, so, when somebody up front says something that really bugs you, you can't stand up <laughs> and say, right. I don't agree. <laughs> I don't right. agree. And you don't feel like, you don't feel courageous enough to walk out. Yeah. So you sit there and you never come back. Yeah, exactly. If, especially if it's the first time that you've come there and you've made no kind of connection with people, which to my mind is what people are really searching for, is a sense of connection and a sense of community, a sense of being part of something that's bigger than just themselves or their family or their friends. So there's usually some kind of deeper engagement, whether it's just turning to the people beside you and talking about kind of the material or, or the speaker or what we just sang or what we just saw presented dramatically and uh, more engagement and more intentionally integrating what's happening as opposed to something happening outside yourself that you're observing and then leaving. Now, um, we have two women guests, the two of you, and <laughs> I, we, there were some other people that we were to talk to and, and they were also women and we tried uh, to get a man, a, rep a male representative. Um, we weren't able to. Just wondering, uh, I know there are men involved in these groups, but I mean, I'm just wondering, are there, are there, um, what's the ratio of men to women in your <laughs> groups? Not good enough. Um, it's <laughs> pretty weighted towards the, the female side of things. And Why do you think that is? <sighs> Beats me, is if I knew. Is, is, is it because men aren't interested in spirituality at that age group, or maybe any age group, or is it because there's something in the message that's alienating them? I'm not sure if it's something in in the message that's alienating them, or if it's the way men tend to be socialized as to be kind of the, ra the rational and the logical um, people, and women are, I believe, more socialized to be emotional and intuitive and to worry about relationships. And so, I mean, that would be my hunch as to part of it, but I mean, I think that's a really good question, and I hope that we can Do you ever talk about that? that? I mean, that, that's, that's taking an issue right where you are. I mean, here we, I mean, that's kind of like the question I was getting at before. I mean, when you have these youth conferences, and and, I, and not just for you, any of us in any of our groups need to ask that. You know, we en tend to be with like-minded people and like-thinking people, mm -hmm. and we get really comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's not just churches or youth groups or any group that everybody does that. And sometimes we have invisible barriers to people outside. So when I said that whether it's people who've never been in the church or whether it's men and women or uh, different people of color and, and, you know, white people. I mean, there's all kinds of er areas where we segregate ourselves or separate ourselves without knowing it. Mm -hmm. Do you ever talk about that? And when, t and hopefully what we're doing is modeling this for other groups. I'm not just, you know, picking on your oh, group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But do you ever talk about that? Or will you, maybe, after we watch the show? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that we try we, I'm talking kind of globally of the yeah. youth and young adult community that I do ministry in, to stay aware of those kinds of issues. I mean, for example, we became really aware a few years ago that young adult seemed to mean uh, single and, and in school. And so somehow there were no people in our community who worked or had children. And so we kind of said, okay, what does that mean? Like, how are we structuring 
what we're doing or what language are we talking that seems to be implying that the people we want are single people who, who are students. Is there much interest in people that are looking good, in people that are interested in other faith groups? I mean, is that something you come to that people would like to meet with other faith groups or is that because we live in a pretty multicultural society, multi-faith? It, really, know, it really is. Um, I find with the people that I work with um, and a lot of what Michelle was talking about earlier about the questioning. Um, along with talking about our own faith, like what are these other faiths that are out there? And um, I certainly, you know, grew up knowing about my denomination within the Christian faith, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you don't get this education in schools, and you didn't. I didn't get it at church. Um, and so I, I grew up with all of these questions, like, what are these other faiths about? Um, what do people in other countries experience? What do people in other denominations within our own area experience, you know, what is, what is their faith all about, um, what is important to them, what are their beliefs, those are things that I, that I grew up questioning and I think that, you know, a lot of the youth especially that I meet are also going through that same questioning process, uh, just wondering and also in their search for what, um, what will meet their needs, they're interested in finding out about these others to see if there might be something something out there that they haven't discovered that might that might meet their needs uh, more efficiently or might be more for them. And then again, also maybe bringing together people that don't have any particular spiritual roots too, finding out just where they're at. I mean, I think that's one of the exciting yeah. things about the time we live in is we can bring together all these uh, kind of special interests. I should say too that if any uh, young people, youth, young adults, uh, mm -hmm. Any seekers at uh, any age or interested or anything can call various denominations. You're with the United Church, mm -hmm. um, but other deno Christian denominations and other faith groups, uh, you know, Jewish groups, Muslim groups, and so on, would have these similar kinds of uh, programs and people like you I'm doing it. Um, just some highlights. Just We don't have a lot of time left, but some of the, the more meaningful things that uh, have been a part of your life in your spiritual journey. Oh, that's a good question. Um, meaningful just a, we just have a few, a little few seconds, moments. so just a couple meaningful moments, just images, maybe some images. Either one of you can just mm. break in right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. Yeah. Um, one, one of the things that, uh, just a highlight experience. Just I, I uh, did some leadership at a youth retreat um, in the Kootenays last year. Um, that was structured around uh, kind of creation and evolution. And these, and these were 14 and 15 year olds who asked that, that, that this would be the theme. They were really struggling with questions of, I go to school and I'm told this, and I go to church and I'm told to read about the creation story in the Bible. And so I worked with them to try and help them find ways of lifting up what their questions were and answering them. And one of the ways I did it was have them read different creation stories and that was just really exciting for them to pick out the similarities between mm -hmm. them. Just a couple of words, Susan? Well, I was able to be part of general council last summer and find out what was happening in the national church, and that was exciting for me as well. Great. We're out of time. Unfortunately, you're both wonderful to talk to. <laughs> Thanks for being with me here. Thanks very Thank much you. for having us. I've been talking with Michelle Slater and Susan Fitch, and they are uh, two women who are a part of the Christian church, and we've been talking about a generation of seekers. Thanks for watching Pressure Point. I'm Brad Newcomb. The preceding program was produced through the facilities of Rogers Community 4, Vancouver. We want to hear from you and invite you to leave your comments and suggestions on our 24-hour response line message machine. Please call 731-5812.